Greetings. It is time to check on one of our most important metrics of technological progress, which is the progress of computational power, and that is best measured through supercomputers. The reason why supercomputers are the purest metric of technological progress is because these are enterprise-grade products. Most people have never seen a supercomputer, but if you were to visit a supercomputer facility, it would just be a large building full of racks and racks of computers with hallways in between. There's nothing fun to look at or anything fun to even do over there. And since a supercomputer's customers are only other large organizations, it does not have to be productized the way a consumer product has to be productized. A supercomputer doesn't have to care about look and feel. It has far fewer constraints in terms of size and energy consumption. It obviously has some constraints, but it has a lot fewer than any consumer product. It doesn't need a marketing campaign. It doesn't have to have nice colors. It doesn't have to be pleasant to the touch. It doesn't have to have a nice industrial design and things like that. Therefore, no engineering decision-making trade-offs have to take those factors into account. And all of the focus can be in squeezing out the maximum performance relative to the cost budget and energy consumption constraints that are required. Therefore, supercomputing power progresses in a purer sense of computational power measurement. Also, the supercomputers of the world are all benchmarked against each other and a list of all the top supercomputers is assembled. Therefore, we can look at the sum total of computational power of all of the top 500 supercomputers in the world and see that total as an even more decentralized measurement of computational progress. This is a website called top500.org and it updates and maintains a list of the top 500 most powerful supercomputers in the world and has done so for a couple of decades. And this website will be in the description box below. So we scroll down to this chart over here. Now what you're seeing here is chronology, time moving forward as we go rightward, and floating point operations per second in this vertical axis. One teraflop is a trillion floating point operations per second. A petaflop is one quadrillion or 10 to the 15th power. An exaflop is one quintillion or 10 to the 18th power. Now of these three lines, the middle line is the least interesting of the three. That is merely the computational power of the most powerful supercomputer of the top 500. This blue line is of some interest because that is the cutoff of the top 500, the number 500 ranked supercomputer of the top 500. Now no supercomputer aspires to be exactly number 500 in rank. They don't know if they're gonna be number 499 or 501 and therefore off the list. They just don't know that. But this measurement is informative in telling us where the cutoff is of the 500 list, which then feeds into the most important line, which is the green line, the, the sum of all of the top 500 supercomputers and gives us an assessment of computational progress to date because this combines supercomputers across multiple organizations and multiple countries. It is a more decentralized assessment of technological progress, including energy consumption constraints. However, what is interesting in looking at these lines is how the number 500 supercomputer power is flatlining, while the number one is not, and therefore the gap between number one and number 500 is widening a great deal. This tells us that for the first time, all these on-demand computational subscription services, such as available through Amazon, Google, Microsoft, etc., where you rent a supercomputer for exactly the time that you need it and you don't have to have any supercomputer on premise, is eating into what was traditionally tracked in this top 500 list. And it's not merely the bottommost supercomputer of the 500 that is being displaced by these subscription services, but many of the lower supercomputers. And that's why this list comes into question because multiple lower ranked supercomputers are being displaced by these subscription services. And the question becomes, does this grand total account for all that? Maybe top500.org is no longer an accurate representation of high powered computing. And if someone else has a more up-to-date source, then I would like to learn about that. And you can leave that in the comments below. 
because if this is the case and therefore there isn't even room for 500 supercomputers anymore which is why you are getting this flat lining in the blue line but not in this green line then that represents a very substantial shift in supercomputing as a whole because you now have on-demand supercomputing a smaller organization can rent a supercomputer for even just one hour if that is what they need it for. That is very cost effective. It might be as little as $900 or $1,000 to rent the supercomputing power that you need for a short while. And it's very efficient. And this being on demand, decentralized and dematerialized means that high performance computing is getting to be more analogous to other forms of on-demand services such as Netflix or Uber from a consumer perspective. And the question becomes, how far does it go? Do all supercomputers other than the top secret ones used by the most classified government institutions get replaced by on-demand high performance computing? And does the high performance computing model scale down all the way to the consumer? It may get to the point where you don't even have a PC in your home. You just subscribe to a service that might be $10 a month and you have computing power that rises or falls based on your application at a given time. So in a way, it's somewhat like a cell phone service, although much cheaper because it would have to be at a pricing closer to $10 a month as an alternative to replace desktop computers and laptop computers in the home. But it'll take some time for that to happen if it happens at all. Coming back to supercomputing, we can see this shift occurring, which leads me to think that maybe computational power is not saturating as much as this graph depicts. In prior versions of this video, I have spoken about this flatlining as indicative of both technological and economic underperformance relative to the trend line. But if this green line is not capturing the full extent of this on-demand subscription type high performance computing use, then perhaps things are not as far behind the trend line as we think. So maybe we have to find another measurement source. Until that time, we will continue to use top500.org as a source because it's the best that we know of so far. Now, as you scroll down in this website, you see this chart, which I don't like because it is a trend line of all three lines, but it's validating this underperformance. So this green line of the top 500 supercomputers combined was advancing in a steady rate until 2013, and then it began to lag. And this lag is being validated by this trend line which I believe is not correct. We should have a trend line that continues the old trend and the underperformance of the new trend should be rejected as not being normal or acceptable, but rather a delta from the trend line because this enables us to quantify where technological progress should be at today versus where it is, as well as the amount of missing economic progress that we have withstood. And that represents money that is not in any of our pockets, but should be. Now to examine that, we go to part two of this video.